Well, welcome. It's great to be here with you this week. I want to welcome Hebron, Jasper County Jail, DeMott Wheatfield online. Welcome. And uh, man, it's good to be here with you this week. And it was great to have communion together last week and to have John Graham bring a great message. He did such a good job and is doing such a good job with our youth ministry, our next gen ministry here. I'm so grateful for him and his wife, Kylie, stepping into that program and doing an awesome job with it. I also want to say thanks to our student leaders. And you guys are just, if you have a student leader, I mean, you're doing so good standing in the gap saying, hey, youth directors come and go, pastors come and go, but a church is for the generations. And for you guys to say, hey, it's not about us, not about our feelings, it's about the gospel of Jesus Christ and worshiping him in all things, I'm proud of you. And then also, I wanna say thanks to our adult volunteers at NextGen. I mean, there is no volunteer position that we have that is more demanding than being an adult volunteer at NextGen. And you guys just standing in the gap saying we are gonna make for a great transition. I am so thankful for you. Can we give them a big round of applause? Thank you guys so much at both locations for being so dedicated and bringing in. I hope that you enjoy a little bit of a slower pace this summer, but thank you guys so much. We're so grateful for you. And uh, you know, last weekend I loved getting to be at our Hebron campus, helping lead communion up there. And uh, man, what a special campus that place is. Just to think that God put such a thriving church in one of the most de-churched communities in the Midwest. And I love that our church, instead of looking at a world saying, oh man, like what's happening? We were like, hey, let's be missional. Let's do this. Let's roar at this. And uh, I'm so grateful for you guys, Hebron. It was such a life-giving experience to get to worship with you guys. And uh, our church, um, a few weeks ago, I asked you guys to give a gift to Ukraine. And uh, we didn't, we didn't, you know, put a big ask behind it or anything. I just said, hey, we want to give a gift to Ukraine. And we did it through kids ministry, through Next Gen, and through adults. And uh, just because of that one simple little ask, we were able to give $23,000 to Ukraine. And that's really cool. I'm grateful for you guys. And uh, I think it's pretty cool that uh, Christians are the most generous people in the world as a matter of statistical fact. And uh, that's pretty neat that our church gets to um, practice that and give to people we don't even know and haven't met, but we're praying for. And I'm excited to be back in this series, Seven Habits to Become the Best Version of Yourself. We are on the fifth habit after doing the habit of wisdom, the habit of peacemaking, the habit of satisfaction, and the habit of mission. Two weeks ago, we did grace and truth. Remember, mission. But this week, I've got a really important habit to talk about. Before I reveal what that is, though, I'd like to start with a story. Now, every year, I paint a huge deck at my mom and dad's lake house. And it's kind of like my rent. You know what I mean? Like, I get to keep my boat there, but I paint the deck. My dad likes to sit and supervise, which is really helpful. I get it. He's earned it. Sit in a chair and watch me do it. But um, no, he does help some, you know, like a little bit. But anyway, um, we use uh, latex solid stain, which is supposed to last for years. It does not last for years. It lasts for one year, probably because of the quality of the craftsmanship, let's be honest. But uh, this is a huge deck. It's really big, like so much deck, like at least 1,300 square feet of deck with railings, spindles, terraces, benches, all kinds of stuff. And the first time I did it, I did it with a roller and a brush, and it was horrible. But then I went out and I got a refurbished, I spent 180 bucks on this thing, a refurbished Graco Magnum Project Painter Plus. And this thing, I'm going to tell you, is a monster. I absolutely love the Graco Magnum Project Painter Plus. I mean, it is such a time saver. It, the first time I did it with a, a roller and a brush, 32,000 steps I took that day. 32,000. That's a lot of steps. That's a whole marathon of steps. I was exhausted. It took me 10 hours of painting. 10 hours to paint the deck. Then I get the Graco refurbished Magnum Project Painter Plus, and I sprayed that bad boy in under two hours. Under two hours, did a better job, took half the paint. I mean, it was the best purchase ever. Now, cleaning it was a chore. It took another hour of cleaning. But I still saved over seven hours every time I paint the deck. And I've done it four times with that thing. So that's like seven times four hours saved. Look, I'm not a mathematician. I know some of you make generalizations about me. I don't know. I don't have an abacus here. I can't do it without that. Now, the real drawback to the Graco Magnum Project Painter Plus is uh, that it's super complicated to get going. And uh, it's, it's just, it's, you gotta do like a chicken dance to get the thing primed. And I mean, it only has five possible controls on it. It has the spray trigger, the nozzle, the on off button, the prime and the power dial. That's it. But you need the instructions to make the thing work, which is a problem because last time I painted, I lost the instructions in a rainstorm. Don't have them anymore. Now that wouldn't be a problem because the internet exists 
except we have bad service at the lake and my dad does not pay for internet at the cabin, which is a bad sense when you're 37 years old and you start something off as an excuse with my dad doesn't pay for, right? I mean, like, not a good look, not a good look. But nevertheless, that's the fact. So I practiced the habit of wisdom and I thought, what will happen if I do this and do I want that, right? I thought ahead, I visualized and I thought, you know what? I need to print off the instructions. We got a little inkjet printer. It's also my dad's printer. <laughs> Also my dad's printer, but uh, just snotted out my nose a little bit right there. Get that a little wiped off. I'll shake my hands after service before I shake, or wash my hands before I shake your hand after service. Anyway, I printed it off. I did not make sure that it had finished printing. I did not check if it was out of paper. I just grabbed it off. It turns out I was missing the first seven pages of the directions before I drove to the lake, which is critical because those first seven pages have the directions on how to prime and start the thing. So I just sent it. I got her all going, but I forgot about one little issue, okay? One little issue. On the spray gun, there is this little thing right here that you got to tighten down. And if you do not tighten this down, there's a little teeny nozzle that it puts all the paint through. But what happens if you don't tighten it down, it won't push the paint through that little hole. It will shoot back in your face with a great deal of violence. So I'm standing here ready to paint and I pull it and it literally goes pow, it pulls forward. And I mean, I look like a mime, like a literal mime, unintentional mime. Like it was to the point where I'm like this, okay? Ah, 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 right? Thank God I had these giant sunglasses on that my son bought for me. But I pulled the trigger three times, like a complete moron, just pow, oh, uh, pow, oh, uh, pow, oh, uh, like that. You know the three stooges when you get a pie in your face, like whatever, that's, that's what it was like. Now. My dad was just laughing super hard. I said, that's great. Enjoy it. But uh, I, thought I, could, I thought I could do it without the instructions. I couldn't. Also, side issue, I had to go to a wake after this, right? So I was like, what am I, I going to do? I'm literally covered in paint. This is ridiculous. But my dad always tells me to read the instructions. John, in life, just read the instructions. And I thought, well, I can just figure it out. When I got this paint sprayer, all of the reviews, and I mean all of the reviews, said, make sure that you read the instructions. And I didn't follow the instructions. I thought I knew it well enough. It turns out I did not know it well enough. And I was standing on the end of my dock, covered in paint and kind of miserable. Why is reading the instructions important? Three reasons. Number one, it saves time. Number two, it prevents you from breaking things and hurting people, namely myself. And it makes for a better experience. It does. And here's my big thought. When it comes to complex things in life, instructions really matter. They make your life better. They save time and they save pain. And today, the habit that I really want to talk about is the habit of reading the instructions. A paint sprayer has a 30 page manual. I brought it in. This is, this is it. This is actually 23 pages. It's missing the first seven because of reasons I've explained. It has a 30 page manual for five buttons. Here's another thought. This is a big deal. I want you to get this. Life is far more complex than a paint sprayer. The consequences are higher in life as well. And if I need an instruction manual to get a paint sprayer going, then I definitely need an instruction manual for life. Now, good thing God gives us an instruction manual for life. It's called the Bible. It's the most influential book in human history. It's 66 small letters and books bound into one large collection. Now, I know some of you might not really like the Bible. Even if you don't really value it, it's probably worth knowing about. It is the most influential book in human history. I would say that this message is probably at least worth leaning into a little bit, even if you don't believe in the Bible. Some of you claim to believe that the Bible is God's word, but you still don't read it. And today I want to talk about how and why to read it, if you don't. Because here's the truth. When it comes to the most important things in life, no matter what, we spend the least amount of time reading the instructions. Why is that? You know, to get a driver's license, which really isn't that big a deal, we spend, you know, hours going to driver's ed and behind the wheels and taking tests and everything else. When it comes to far bigger things like mate selection, like selecting your spouse, we just send it. Think about how much money a young couple today will have go through their fingers over the course of a lifetime. With compound interest and inflation, it's probably going to be with average incomes, $11 million. How many books would you read before making an $11 million investment? For most of us, the answer is none. Because when it comes to the most important things in life, we spend the least amount of time reading the instructions. We just send it. We're like, oh, she's cute. He's cute. That's good. Let's get married. I like you. You like me. I have no self-esteem. Let's get engaged. You know what I mean? Here's the thing. Marriage is more than money. It's more than $11 million. You are picking your kid's future parent. 
You're picking your best friend and we put very little time into it. We don't read the instructions and that's just marriage. When it comes to life and eternity, some of us spend even less time reading the instructions, which blows my mind. I mean, we don't think about an overarching goal. We think about like limited future, like in the next decade, I want to go into business. I want to be rich. I want to whatever. I want to have kids. I want to whatever. But we don't think about the overarching goals. We don't think about what we want to accomplish when we're 80. We don't think about what happens when we die. We don't really ask for advice or read books about the overarching goals of life, which is crazy to me because the problem is when it comes to the most important things in life, we spend the least amount of time reading the instructions. Today, I wanna challenge you to consider reading the instructions for life. What we're gonna do in this talk, three major sections. Number one, I wanna talk about reasons we don't read the directions. Instructions is what it should say, but nevertheless, it says directions. I wanna talk about how it's put together, the Bible, I don't want to talk about how to read it. Now, to get started, I know a lot of you wonder, like, how do you know that God's instruction manual is actually from God? And I originally wrote this big, long section on, you know, the fulfilled prophecy of the Bible, the archaeological and historical evidence, you know, all the statistical, the data behind it, shows us that the Bible is a supernatural book and the only one like it that we know of in the human experience. But my wife was like, boring. You always preach about that, John. And she's right. I do. I preached more on this topic than any other topic at church. I've done at least 16 messages on it. So I'll say this. If you want to know why the Bible is more than just pithy sayings from antiquity that are helpful today, why we know for a fact that the Bible is the inspired, infallible, transcendent, unchanging, inerrant, totally sufficient, final authority for Christians in the church, Check out one of the many sermons I've already done on this. I will link them in the description to this message when it is posted. Messages and series like Can We Trust the Bible, The Bible for Grownups, Atheism versus Christianity, and Do All Roads Lead to Heaven? Okay, I've done a ton of messages, at least 16, probably more. But today, I wanna focus on how to read the Bible and why we don't read it. And we'll start with reasons we don't read the instructions. And the first reason is that we think we already know it. We think we already know it. Some of you might think you already know the Bible super. It's like, Pastor, look, I've been going to church all my life. I don't need to keep reading the direct. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure I know. Listen, we don't just need to know it. We need to be able to so passionately know it that we can say it, spray it, wheel it, deal it, and make the next generation feel it. And I tell people all the time, pastors come and go. Styles come and go. Nations rise and fall. Generations come and go, but the word of the Lord will stand forever. And I want grandparents, parents, and students to know the Bible so passionately that future generations and everybody that interacts with us is like, wow, like he loves God's word. She loves God's word. I need to see what's going on with the instruction manual for life. You know, the analogy breaks down a little bit because the Bible's more than instructions as well. I think it reveals God's heart for us. You know, I read through the whole Bible about once a year. And I found that every time I read it, I see new things. I love the way that the author of Hebrews puts it in Hebrews 4 and verse 12. It says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit. I love that line, cutting between soul and spirit. This is so true. Between joint and marrow, it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. So many times I've been fighting with my wife or dealing with an issue in life. And I'll go to all the mentors and the conventional wisdom and the TED Talks that I have, but in studying God's instruction manual to me, I'll, cut, I'll be cut between soul and spirit. I mean, God's word is powerful, alive, and active, and it has cut to the heart so many times in my life, helping me see things I never would have seen. I never would have seen. The second reason many of us don't read the instructions is um, we know what it says and we think we're the exception. We think we know better, or we just don't care or believe in it or trust in it anymore. And I think there's a lot of us in this boat. And there's a really good reason why the most, or the least, excuse me, there's a reason why the least Christian generation in American history, which is also the richest and most privileged, is also the least happy, most psychologically afflicted generation in American history. I think the Bible was right when it said in Romans 3, 23, that everybody has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. And I think what's happened is we have a young generation that denies that. I don't need the instructions because I'm a good person. Just do whatever feels good. You just listen to your heart. You just work hard every day and you just do what you want and you're good and you're a firework and you just do you, you do you. You know what? I don't think that's worked very well for the youngest generation. I think we see this super easily offended, hypersensitive, very psychologically afflicted generation in America right now. It's not good. It turns out Judeo-Christian morals help in life. And what's interesting is in the midst of this, there is this beacon of hope in American society called the Christian church 
Religious people, according to a broad range of studies. Now, the studies on this uh, that are done in America, if you look on Google Scholar, they're all, um, they're done on religiosity is the word that they use. But if you look in the methods, um, they're talking about religion generically, but in general, most of the people who have been studied are Christians, because that's what most religious people in America are, right? And what we find is that people who are weakly engaged with a religious organization, mostly church, have higher levels of life satisfaction, are far more generous. Christians in particular are the most generous people in the world, already said that, but really cool. Have higher fertility rates, have more stable families, have lower occurrences of mental illness, that's really cool. And then Christians, this is specific to Christians, who are engaged with church on a weekly level, not people who are like, I don't need to go to church to believe in God. People who actually go to church on a weekly level have seven more years of life expectancy. And so many of you guys are like, I need to do paleo, detox, anti-inflammatory, intermittent, whatever, because I need to add a six months to my, it's like, no, stop. Go to church, seven years that adds to your life. That's pretty interesting and amazing and powerful what that does. People tell me, I don't have enough time to go to church. It's like, you don't have enough time to not go to church. Pretty impressive. In the end, I know a lot of you were raised in church and are rebelling or you have rebelled for a time. And you thought, look, I don't need the instructions. I know how to do this, I can figure it out. And you ended up standing at the end of your deck in your proverbial life, covered in paint. That's what the data tells us happens when we disregard God's instructions. I love the way that James, the half-brother of Jesus, puts it. He says, for if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and you forget what you look like. This is so many of us, isn't it? I know some of us today, you were raised knowing God's word, you were raised in church, you were raised in a Christian home, maybe you even went to Christian school, but you've forgotten what your reflection looks like. You walked away from God's instructions, and I know some of you, you don't even really know who you are anymore. You're aimless, wandering, unhappy, angry, and lost. And I always ask people, like, come in my office, you know, you've deconverted, you've walked away, you've rebelled, and I say, hey, when were you the happiest you've ever been in your life? They say, man, when I was engaged with God's church. It's like, yeah. Get back in tune with God's instruction manual for your life in many ways. It's a mirror that shows you who you really are. Would you consider coming back to God's instructions? I wanna talk for a minute about how the Bible is put together because here's the truth. The third reason many of us don't read the Bible is uh, that we don't know where to start. I'll tell you this. When I fire up the paint sprayer, I don't read the whole manual, okay? I don't. I don't read it cover to cover. Um, I, I, I go to where I need to go to. I definitely skip that safety stuff. Maybe I, I shouldn't, but I do. Um, I skip the system orientation stuff. Don't need none of that. What I do when I'm firing up the paint sprayer is I go to start up and when I'm tearing it down, I go to preparation for long-term storage. Those are the two things that I do with my paint sprayer, right? The Bible is similar to an instruction manual. You go to the section you need to go to to do what you need to do. And uh, I wanna spend a moment familiarizing you with the Bible, okay? Um, the Bible's put together in two major sections, the Old Testament, the New Testament. The Old Testament is like system familiarization. It's that orientation at the start of the instruction manual. Helps you understand the background. Is it important? Yes. Is it part of the whole manual? Yes. Should you remove it from the Bible? Absolutely not. It's all part of God's word. Is it where you should spend most of your time reading the instructions? No. The Old Testament is disproportionately larger than the New Testament in word count. It's about 70% of the Bible, but I think you should only spend 10 to 30% of your time reading it. The New Testament, that's how you actually operate life. It's where you'll spend most of your time when you're studying God's instruction manual. Even though it's only about 30% of the Bible, I think you should spend 70 to 90% of your time focusing on the New Testament. Now, I wanna spend a second familiarizing you with the New Testament in the Bible. It is, of the 66 books of the Bible, the last 27 books. And it's split into about four sections, depending on how you split it. But the first section is called the section of Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all biographies of Jesus' life. Okay, so if you're reading the books of the New Testament, you're like, these are all the same. Well, they are very similar. Each one is a different biography of Jesus' life. The first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are all super similar. They're called the Synoptic Gospels. They're all written um, for slightly different audiences. Matthew is written for Jews. So there's a lot of Jewish culture and tradition that's uh, included in there that might not make sense to you, but it definitely makes sense to a Jewish person. Mark was written kind of for men, people who ain't got time for that. I don't need the emotions. I don't need the details. It's just like we went here, then we went here, then we went here. It's like asking your husband how his work day was. I did this, I did this, I did this. It was good. What about your feelings? I ain't got time for that. Okay, that's Mark. Luke was written for eggheads. Archaeological detail, corroborative evidence are a big part of the book of Luke. If you want to be able to cross-reference, check um, and Google to make sure that, hey, this is what it is and this is what it means, Luke is a great book to do that. It is really, really helpful. Then there's John. 
And John's different than the first three. It is not chronological. It doesn't take place in order. It was written by Jesus' best friend, who was a firsthand eyewitness, the disciple John. It was written um, after the first three were written as a supplement to them. So it covers a lot of different things that the first three don't cover. It's a very interesting book. The next section in the Bible is just one book. It's the book of Acts, and it's the story of the disciples after Jesus died and rose from the grave. It's the story of the early church. I love this book. Super interesting, riveting read, just about how the church got started. Very inspiring. Then the big section of the New Testament is the next 21 books. And all of these together are letters to the church and pastors about how to follow Jesus. And these are the most instruction manually types of books in the whole Bible. If you're having trouble with sexual sin or debating what kind of sex is okay as a Christian, read 1st and 2nd Corinthians. They too had a lot of questions about this. And God through Paul defines it super, super clearly. He's like, hey, this is what's okay. This is what's not. They were also having trouble with orderly worship. They liked to hoot and holler and speak in tongues in church and you know, rave women, uh, wave ribbons and do all kinds of stuff in church. And, 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 and God's like, hey, you're scaring the children. Okay, like you need to, you need to, you need to calm down with, with some of that stuff in church. And he's like, church is not some like seeker sensitive. You come and, and get yourself fed and get, it's a place to make deep disciples of Jesus. You can't just preach expository verse by verse messages that feed the people. You gotta inspire people to go and make disciples of all the nations, right? It's a big instruction set on how to do church. Then um, if you are a leader in life, let's say you're a Christian business person or um, you are a life group leader um, or a church leader, read what's called the pastoral letters, Titus in First and Second Timothy. It's all about how to lead as a Christian. If you want some theology, you know, and you're kind of wondering, how does Jesus' sacrifice on the cross actually pay for my sins? Like, what's the deal with that? The book of Romans talks about the theological significance of what's called substitutionary atonement, how that works. Hebrews focuses on how Jesus is the predicted savior of the Old Testament and how Jesus supersedes the old Jewish system. If you ever wonder, how does Christianity and Judaism work together? What's the deal with that? That's the book of Hebrews. If you need relationship advice or marriage help, the book of Ephesians is an awesome reference. Then the last book of the Bible is the last section, which is the book of Revelation. And it's a book on prophecy. Now there's some debate about what the book of Revelation is actually about, but I will say at the most minimal level, the book of Revelation is all about in the worst situations, Jesus still wins. If your life is falling apart, if you think the world, and you're worried about wars and the world and you know, politics and whatever else, and you read the book of Revelation, what it tells you is that Jesus wins and it's gonna be okay. And I love it for that reason. And that's how the New Testament's put together. It's pretty simple, just these sections. Lastly, I wanna talk about how to actually read the Bible. Uh, some principles that I like to apply, and really I've got three principles that I apply to reading the New Testament of the Bible. The first one is um, flip to the section that you're interested in. When I fire up the paint sprayer, I don't read the instruction manual cover to cover. What I also don't do is play a game called Bible Roulette, which a lot of people do where you just kind of, you know, go through here and you just, nah, I'm gonna read this. Like, no, 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 no. That would be unhelpful if I'm reading the paint sprayer manual, just like, nah, nah, nah. no, no, no. I go to the table of contents, I go to the index, and I find the part of the manual that I need, right? That's what you do. For beginners, because I know a lot of you are like, well, pastor, I read the table of contents in the Bible. It's just a bunch of books that I can barely pronounce names. What do I do? How do I find what I need? Okay, the best um, interactive table of contents that I know of for the Bible is called the YouVersion Bible app. Now, there's lots of Bible apps in the app store. The YouVersion is free and it's the best and it's published by a church that I love called Life Church. It is the most popular. It has over half a billion downloads. You can do Bible plans with friends or alone. What you do is you just tap on plans, then you tap discover and you search for any Bible reading plan that you want on forgiveness, on anger, on anxiety, on theology, whatever the issue is with your paint sprayer in life is, you just search for that. This app is a super smart index, a super smart table of contents that helps you get to the part of the Bible that you need to get to. Now, I will say this, one issue with the YouVersion Bible app is that it automatically defaults to the King James Version of the Bible. And I know some of you like the old, old English. Listen, the King James Version was made with inferior Greek Hebrew manuscripts in 1611. And as an ESL man who can barely read, I'm telling you, it's hard to read. I like that, okay? I like the New Living Translation and the ICB, the International Children's Bible. You know why? Because they're easy to understand. So switch to those versions. That's just a side note. But the YouVersion Bible app is like an index, table of contents that brings you to where you need to be in God's instruction manual. You can also use a program called Right Now Media. And uh, Right Now Media is like Netflix for Bible studies. Um, you can sign up on your blue card, 
which I have right here. You just write here, I would like a uh, subscription to Right Now Media. We already paid for it as a church. So everybody here, it's free to you. Church paid for it. It's done. Lots of you can use it for free. There's tons of good kids content on there, um, which I love. There's lots of good adult content on there. That didn't sound right. There's lots of good content for information for adults. Right Now Media, okay? Um, so that's great. If you put that on your blue card and turn it in after service, we'll send you an invite for free. And then the last thing I use, this is really helpful for my family as a sort of index to get in, is uh, called Dinner Table Devotionals. I probably use this bad boy like, I don't know, three times a week with my kids. And I lead a discussion. There's some great like ways just to get into God's word in there. It's really helpful. And I make it a little more age appropriate for my younger kids, but I have loved the discussions we've had. And this is like a great index to get into God's word. Second principle, after read the part of the Bible that you're interested in, second principle, read for more than just problems, read for relationships. When my second born daughter, Hermione, wrapped up the school year the other day, <clears throat> she brought home a journal. And you know, every kid is different. Three of my kids are huge extroverts. Hermione is an introvert. All the kids are gigg giggling and having fun. And she's like, this is too much. I'm going up to my room. And she's just by herself. She's a very private person. And one night I was putting her to bed right after school. And she puts this journal in my hands. She said, daddy, I want you to read it. And this was like a golden opportunity for me. I was so excited. I read every page and I treasured it. I couldn't believe that she'd entrusted me with this part of her life. It was, you know, the inane flotsam and jetsam of a second grader school year. But I loved, I loved gaining insights into her heart. You know, I wasn't reading it because I wanted to know how to do life better. I was reading it because I loved my daughter and I wanted to know more about her life. Be honest with you, this was not Nobel Prize winning literature, not, not even close. But I read it and I savored every word. You know why? because I love my daughter and I want a relationship with her. In a very similar way, when I'm reading the Bible, I'm not only reading for information that I need, I'm reading because I wanna know more about the God we love and serve. And I'll be honest, parts of the Bible, they're not the most riveting things that I've ever read in my life. But because I love God, because I want a relationship with God that is deeper, because I wanna know him, I savor it and I read it. Third thing, this is a big deal. Um, this, this is actually a really big point. It's probably the most practical of the whole message. So you're gonna wanna lean into this and the two things that come right after it. Um, read knowing that the Bible is about God and not you. The easiest way to fall into heresy, the reason why the um, cult of progressive Christianity exists is because of doing this the wrong way. What, what progressive Christians do is they say, what does the Bible say about me? That is wrong. That is a wrong way to read the Bible. When you read the Bible, there are two questions that I ask myself. Number one, what did I learn about God today? And number two, how, how shall I now, now live? Because the Bible is not a book that, that's about me. It is about God, right? I'm getting to know who God is as I read the Bible. Hermione's journal wasn't about me. It was about her. And as I read it, I was learning about her. When you read the Bible, understand that like, this isn't about you. It's about God revealing himself to you. You ask, what does this say about God today? And how shall I now live? These two questions guide my Bible reading. You know what, the longer I've asked these things, the better I've gotten, it, gotten at it. And I don't need like a ton of interpretation. I can read the Bible and learn about God all by myself. Super helpful. It's really blessed me. I'd encourage you to start using these two questions, especially as you're reading the New Testament. And as you do this, you're gonna begin to see themes and stories. One last little pro tip. I like to use a YouTube channel called The Gospel Project. And if I'm reading the Bible, all I do is if there's a specific book that I'm diving into, I'll like Google The Gospel Project, Ephesians, or whatever book I'm reading. And um, it gives a video summary of every book of the Bible in about 10 minutes. And it's super, super helpful for me to learn the context and background of a book of the Bible. Here's the truth though. I look at the world today and I see an American population that has been abandoning the word of God. And I think there's no doubt about this. The results are super clear. The richest, most free generation in American history is also the least satisfied, most angry, most medicated, most mentally ill, easily offended, thin-skinned generation in American history. And I think the problem is a lot of us are trying to use the paint sprayer of life. And for whatever reason, we're too good for the instructions. And I think a lot of us have hit this place where in spite of our greatest efforts, we pull the trigger of life and it ends up blowing all up in our face. And honestly, as I sat at the end of my dock, <laughs> I was really frustrated. I had just bought five gallons of paint. I've op I'd opened up the bucket. I took a half day to paint that deck. You know, I took a half day off of work. I got out there, got everything in order. 
and I'm standing at the end of my dock, not really knowing what was wrong, covered in pain, unable to see anything. My dad's laughing at me. Everybody's laughing at me. I feel dumb. I just felt foolish. And I was angry, dejected, and discouraged. Now, you all laugh at my pain because I'm your pastor and that's what you do. But I was really frustrated. See, I'd woken up with big goals. And before noon in my day, I'd failed miserably. I wasn't sure what was wrong, but I knew that I was stuck. And I wonder if there's anybody here who's in life, proverbially in the same spot. You just said, you know what, forget God's directions, I don't need them. And you get out there in life and you kind of put it all together and you think you're doing it okay and you pull the trigger and pow, you're covered. You're frustrated and your life's a mess. I love the way that the author of Hebrews puts it. It says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. I'm gonna be honest. This imagery sounds painful, and that's because it is. There have been times in my life where the word of God is cut between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow, and it's like, that was painful. And I think the temptation is to run away and say, I don't need the directions. I don't wanna go through all that work. I don't wanna go through all that pain. I don't wanna face that soul surgery. And I've just ended up in more of a mess. But when I've come back to God's word and just submitted to it and trusted God's word to me, my life has been healed. The mess has been cleaned up. I wanna call some of you who are standing in the mess of life back to God's word today. I always say, this is a church where no one's perfect and everyone's welcome. And I know for so many of you, that sounds great till you meet all the imperfect people. And it's like, so-and-so at church hurt me. They're all hypocrites. Listen, God can clean up our messes. It is because of this truth that I say that. Just read the instructions. For some of you, I challenge you to give your kids and grandkids the inspiration to trust God's word through your passionate example. Lean into it, lead your family in it. For others of you, especially even if you're not a Christian or you're a wandering Christian, the Word of God is the most transformational book in human history. As a matter of historical fact, it gave women a voice. It made child sex abuse a not okay thing. It gave us hospitals, orphanages, and the scientific method. As a matter of historical fact, all those things, it has done more good for humanity measurably than any other writing by a long shot. I don't know where you're at in life, but this week I wanna challenge you to read the instructions. Read the instructions for life. On your blue card, normally there is a QR code that leads to discussion questions. This week it still says discussion questions, but that is inaccurate. This week, if you go and do that QR code, it will lead you to a link to download the YouVersion Bible app. And my simple challenge is this. I want you to read the instructions for one week. Do one Bible plan, one Bible plan. You can do it with your friends. Um, you know, you can friend people on, on the Bible app, which is kind of cool and kind of fun to be able to do that together. But would you please read the instructions this week. Do a Bible plan on whatever you need to do it on. If you're a skeptic, do a Bible plan on the Bible for skeptics. If you're dealing with unforgiveness, depression, anxiety, if you're dealing with busyness, do a Bible plan on any of those things. Use God's instruction manual to light the way and clear the path for you to thrive in this life. As we close, I'd like to call you to stand to your feet at all of our locations. And I'd like to have a prayer with you. Let's pray together. God in heaven, I thank you for your transcendent, unchanging, totally sufficient word. And God, in a chaotic world, I ask that our church would be a beacon of stability and steadfast faithfulness. Would you give us a legacy of generation after generation that loves your word? Would you make our passion for your word something that's outrageous and contagious? Would you make us a people who trust you, study you, and for the sake of relationship, learn about you through your word. Would you bless our time this week as we study you through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen and amen. Let's sing this last song together.